Hello everyone, and welcome to our second week back for Surveillance Report 49, where we are dedicated to keeping you private and secure and up to date with the latest news in the world. This report is gonna recap some of the most notable events in the last week, including some new Pegasus updates, which we already started talking about last week, um, the very much uh, hyped up Windscribe VPN incident, which we will talk about, some new interesting research, and a lot more. I'm Henry from Techlore. I am Nathan from The New Oil. And today, you know what, like, I feel like we don't give the Monero community enough love. Both Nathan on, on the new oil and we at Techlore accept Monero and we very much accept donations and we enjoy that kind of stuff. So if you're someone who likes Monero and you want to spare us some donations to keep this show going for free, that would be awesome. Um, just wanted to let you guys know, like we, we like Monero. Monero is, Monero is life, Monero is love. I think I did that backwards. I think it's love life. Live, laugh, <laughs> love. <laughs> <laughs> Not even where I was going, but we'll take it. We'll go ahead and start with the data breaches. We'll just get into it. So our first data breach comes from Estonia. A cyber criminal has downloaded close to 300,000 personal ID photos. I mean, that's pretty much all there is to this story. An Estonian cyber criminal stole 286,438 government ID photos. So, you know, like driver's licenses and stuff like that, along with names and ID codes. A suspect has been arrested. And at this time, there's really no motive seems like he just did it because he could if we learn anything else we'll keep you updated the 2020 olympics in tokyo have been hit by a data breach and information was leaked online this came from fujitsu and information included login details and passwords of ticket holders, which in and of itself is not necessarily a problem. I mean, you know, it's a problem, but it's not like a huge thing. However, those accounts can now be logged into to obtain other sensitive information like names, addresses, and bank account numbers. The number of affected records was not disclosed, but it was described as quote, not substantial. University of California, San Diego Health has disclosed a data breach after a phishing attack. This affected patients, employees, and students between December 2nd, 2020 and April 8th, 2021. They haven't really commented too much, so we don't know for sure, but potential information that could have been disclosed includes full name, dates of birth, email address, fax number, insurance information, lab results, health information, social security numbers, government ID numbers, student ID numbers, payment or financial information, and username and password. UCSD is one of the nation's best hospitals and has a capacity of 808 beds. We're talking like a four or five month period, probably a pretty significant number of people caught up in this. We're going to go to Canada, where Calgary's Parking Authority has exposed drivers' personal data and tickets. Calgary has a lot of pay for parking in their town, and the Parking Authority charges directly for about 14% of those paid spots. It's not like a third-party thing. Unfortunately, they were storing payment information on an unencrypted server. No password, no nothing, just log on and browse it. And the data that you could have accessed includes full names, dates of birth, phone numbers, email and postal address, information about any parking tickets or offenses, in which case would also be included license plates and vehicle data and and in some cases, location data, as well as partial card numbers and expiration dates. So lots of information. They don't know if this information has been accessed yet or you know what it was used for, but as always, you should assume that if it was open, somebody probably found it. An unknown number of British Columbians' personal information has been found for sale after Homewood Health was extorted. Homewood Health is a mental health services provider and they were quote unquote hacked earlier this year. That's all they said. They didn't say if it was like ransomware or what. Once again, they did not comment on the number of records or the information itself actually, but it appears to impact both employees and patients. And the attack actually trickled down to other agencies that work with Homewood Health, like BC Housing, TransLink, and the Provincial Health Services Authority. Northern Ireland's COVID certification service was suspended after a data leak. Northern Ireland's Department of Health, they had an online portal where you could apply for a digital certification proving that you've been vaccinated. It's not really a breach because this is again, kind of like the unsecured server thing from Calgary. We don't really know if anyone took advantage of this, but basically there was a glitch where certain users users were able to view the information of other users. In theory, a malicious actor could have found that and decided to take advantage of it. The article doesn't really give a lot of details, but it said that the systems were temporarily taken offline so the problem could be fixed. Our last article from Data Breaches isn't really a data breach, but it's just something worth knowing. It says enterprise data breach cost reached record high during the pandemic. Basically, the average cost of a data breach is now $4.24 million according to IBM, which is up 10% from 2020. So this stuff is just getting more and more expensive. The amount of time to detect and contain a data breach is also also up to 287 days on average. And even using solutions like AI and machine learning and encryption, companies still only saved about $1.5 million. So personal opinion, I think most companies are willing to take the gamble until regulations start finding them and making them hurt. And then they'll start paying attention. Now we're gonna move on to companies and we're gonna kick right off with the Winscribe incident. So Winscribe is a VPN provider. The headline is VPN servers seized by Ukrainian authorities weren't encrypted. I'm gonna start off by saying the headline's a little bit misleading. Winscribe had two servers 
servers in Ukraine that were confiscated by authorities in regards to an investigation. So the servers are running OpenVPN, but they used outdated settings from 2018, which was tied to a vulnerability that could decrypt the data. This wasn't actually like, oh, these are just unencrypted servers for anyone to just go access. Winscribe did address this very quickly within a couple weeks that it was discovered. They have now patched the issue, but the authorities were able to seize and decrypt the data. This was a big oversight by them. It was a vulnerability that was disclosed three years ago and they haven't updated. So it's the kind of thing that they should be defending against. They published a blog post covering like what they did and what they hope to do to address this issue in the future. Couple things here. One, this is why, like we always say, even if you use VPNs, you should always be careful with them. It doesn't mean they're terrible tools and you should never use VPNs. It just means that there are very valid concerns and you should understand that when you're using a VPN provider. Two, this didn't just impact Winscribe. The Winscribe CEO actually dumped some server certificates from other VPN providers. NordVPN could have been hit by this, ExpressVPN, TorGuard, and Perfect Privacy. The one provider that was specifically mentioned by the Winscribe CEO for doing things properly was iVPN. So this story, I think overall was very much blown out of proportion. At least people misunderstood what it meant and like the actual error that was done. It's good in my opinion that Winscribe seemed to respond really well to this. They didn't try to like throw this under the rug and they said, hey, like we f***ed up. As always, you're placing a lot of trust in a VPN provider. Up next, we're gonna go over to Google News. Google, they have that Google Flock technology that we've been talking about for a while now. Luckily, it's been very unpopular. It's essentially a privacy sandbox that's trying to replace cookies so that Google essentially has more first party control of what to do with people's data. They have updated the schedule for this privacy sandbox flock technology for phasing out cookies. And the new timeline split the bundle of technologies into five phases, which they hope to integrate into Chrome by 2023. The next Google News is just quick. It's almost a research article, but it's just a new Android malware that records smartphones via VNC to steal their passwords. It's just a new malware called Vulture. It's also a banking Trojan, but it can record your smartphone via remote visual desktop software. It also requires you to fall for it. So beware of phishing scams and also beware of shady apps and try to get your apps from trusted sources. Okay, this week we just have one Apple story. Apple has fixed a zero day affecting iPhones and Macs exploited in the wild. It was known as CVE 2021-30807. It was a memory corruption issue on the IO mobile frame buffer kernel extension. I don't know what that means, but I'm sure some of you out there do. It was reported by an anonymous researcher and and patches have been released. For those of you who are wondering, this does not involve Pegasus in any way, shape, or form. We'll talk about that a little more in a minute. In a minute. Even still, it fixes a zero day, so you should definitely take advantage of that and update if you are an Apple user. Up next, we're gonna go over to Instagram, who's released a new feature. Nathan wrote in the notes here, we still think Instagram is trash and you shouldn't use it, but this is a good example of privacy by default because Instagram is now defaulting users under 16 into private accounts so that their information by default won't be visible to the world. We need to see more things like this in our opinion. Instagram is still privacy invasive themselves Cells, we know this and there's still security issues and it's still Facebook. We know we're not saying it's a good service he should be using. We just, we applaud some good moves that were made. Disclaimer is unclear. Downloaded Instagram. Now we're going to move on to the app Citizen, which is pretty controversial. Citizen is now hiring New Yorkers at $25 an hour to live stream crimes. The weird thing about this is this seems to have been going on for quite a while, this hiring people, and they're doing it really in secret, like in the name of shell corporations. They're framing it in the context of like filming it for journalism purposes. The whole thing is just really shady and, and being kept on the down low and they're kind of distancing themselves from it. This next story is a quick update to a story we've covered some time ago. I believe it was last year. There was this couple in Natick, Massachusetts who ran their own little independent newsletter. They may have said some critical things about eBay. Maybe they didn't, but for whatever reason, some of the supervisors at eBay took this newsletter really personally and started cyber stalking this couple. At one point, they sent them the pig mask from the Saw franchise and another time they sent a book that was like how to deal with the loss of a loved one, basically kind of implying like we're going to kill you. This is one of the supervisors, I guess the rest are still pending, has been sentenced to 18 months in prison, one year of home detention, concurrent with three years of supervised release. eBay is of course distancing themselves from this and saying this was not officially sanctioned behavior. They were rogue employees. Stuff like that is why I really encourage people to use PO boxes and fake names and stuff because you never know who's just going to take something the wrong way and go off the deep end. Our last company story is just a real quick update. The ransomware gang Doppelpamer has rebranded as Grief. In the future, expect us to hear us talking about them and know that they used to be Doppelpamer. Next, let's move into research. So our first research story, a researcher just out of sheer boredom did a Google search for PHP MySQL email register and found a whole ton of tutorials and code snippets. The issue is he found that a lot of these tutorials and examples 
had vulnerabilities to SQL injection attacks, basically meaning they shouldn't be shared. They were inherently unsafe. The moral of the story here, just be aware of copying, pasting things without understanding what you're doing. I run my own Nextcloud server. I use Linux. It is fairly common for me to have to look up, you know, okay, what is what does this code mean? How do I do this? Make sure you're not just copy paste. Make sure you're actually understanding what is the code I'm putting in doing? What is the command doing? And what does the error mean? Because otherwise you run the risk of copying and pasting something malicious like that or something unintentionally vulnerable. Up next, there was a new report published by BlackBerry's research and intelligence team that pretty much says that malware developers are turning to more exotic programming languages to help in their quest of thwarting the researchers. They're essentially using these less popular and unusual coding languages, and that's making it harder for them to detect the languages and what they're doing. The main languages that seem to be used are Go, like Golang, D, Dlang, Nim, and Rust, which are the most commonly done to try to evade detection by the security community. Up next, this one's pretty cool. There's something called the FG01, which is the first tool that is aimed to defeat gate recognition. Now, for those who don't know, gate recognition would go under like biometric surveillance where you can identify someone by the way they walk at their gate. So someone has released a 3D printable shoe extension that can change your step length and foot tilt angle. When this is used in conjunction with baggy clothes, they claim that this should help you defeat most gate recognition systems in a healthier way than like a rock in your shoe. The author notes that they have not had a chance to actually test this against a real world known gate recognition system. So it's not necessarily like a recommended solution yet, but it seems to in theory work. Then last but not least, we have a another slightly misleading headline. The title says, you really shouldn't roll your own crypto, an empirical study of vulnerabilities in cryptographic libraries. Basically researchers examined eight existing open source cryptographic libraries, which were OpenSSL, GNU TLS, Mozilla NSS, Wolf SSL, Botan, LibG, Crypt, Libra SSL, and Boring SSL. It's a pretty short article. It's only 15 pages. Feel free to go read it. The main takeaway for me, basically they found that the more bloated a code was, like the more code there was, the more complex it was, the more vulnerabilities they found, which is probably not surprising. I think the reason they chose that headline, you really shouldn't roll your own crypto, was just kind of to say this stuff is really hard and even stuff that has been around for a long time is not necessarily perfect. And so by going it alone, you really run the risk of making it worse or making really big mistakes. Let's move into politics. We'll start with an update on Pegasus. First off, somebody in the cybersecurity subreddit has shared what they claim is a document dump regarding Pegasus, like manuals and memos and stuff that kind of better explains how it works and what it does. They also claim to have an Android variant of Pegasus if any of you are code savvy and want to run it or examine it in a controlled environment like a virtual box. It should be noted, do so at your own risk. This is a random stranger on Reddit. If you like getting your information straight from the source, this could potentially be a good source, run it at your own risk. Meanwhile, Israel has opened an official investigation into the NSO group. On Wednesday, unidentified Israeli government groups visited the offices. NSO is cooperating at this point in time based on other journalistic reports in the recent past, like the past week or so. The groups involved are believed to be the foreign ministry, the justice ministry, military intelligence, and Mossad. We will let you know what they say when they say something. Our next update is about the Kessia ransomware. We talked about how our evil had disappeared and also Darkseid, who was responsible for like the colonial pipeline in the JBS ransomware attack. Both of those kind of disappeared and they seem to have resurfaced as Black Matter and Heron. Researchers are saying they're showing a lot of the same behavior, same code, same tactics. So they're probably rebrands. Kind of like earlier, we talked about uh, grief and doppelpamer. It's just one of those things worth having on your radar. Our next story is going to be about unemployment benefits. You may have to submit to facial recognition first. Colorado, the state of Colorado, now requires facial recognition verification from a service called ID.me to claim unemployment benefits. So that's pretty much the main story. We're starting to see this increase and rise in privacy invasive tech in the world, where even getting things like unemployment are gonna require handing over facial recognition first. Um, unemployment agencies in 25 states with two more on the way have already teamed up with ID.me. The next one I thought was pretty fun. I'll, I'll tell you why at the end. Fresno in California wants to watch you as you park at the park. Fresno City Council has unanimously approved the use of automated license plate readers at two of the city's largest parks, which I believe is Woodward Park and Roading. At this time, it seems like a fairly decent system. So when a car enters the park, they have 30 minutes to pay via a kiosk or a mobile app or leave. And if they don't, the system will summon a nearby officer. The database is cleared daily and not open to police. Keywords at this time. So we'll see if that opens up. Why this is funny is I was at Woodward Park last weekend. Our next story, I thought 
that this was like somehow an exaggerated or misleading headline, but nope. So the headline says, police are telling ShotSpotter to alter evidence from gunshot detecting AI. Police around the country are using an audio surveillance technology called ShotSpotter, which is basically a whole bunch of microphones that are designed to detect and know any gunshots that they pick up and to note the time and location. There's also human analysts who work there. So if ShotSpotter hears something and it's not totally sure if it was a gunshot or not, then a human can listen to it and say like, oh no, that was a firework or like, yes, that was a gunshot or whatever. Long story short, the police have an unarguable proven record of asking ShotSpotter basically like, hey, can you take another look at this? Are you sure that that wasn't a gunshot? Are you sure that that wasn't at this time in this place? And basically they're altering evidence to fit their stories. They're basically planning evidence. This is one of the reasons that we don't like this AI stuff. It's only as good as the information that's put into it, especially when it can be altered after the fact. I don't know what could have been done to prevent this other than just not using it altogether, which is fine with me. Our next story is a piece of good news. President Biden here in the US has issued a national security memorandum ordering a baseline performance goal to be set for critical infrastructure operators. So in other words, CISA and NIST now have to get together and develop minimum cybersecurity standards for high level companies to follow. Personally, I think this is a really good thing. Bruce Schneier in one of his books makes the argument that when the government sets this kind of baseline, manufacturers will start producing that for the public sector too, because now that's a marketing thing. They can stick that on the box and be like, we meet CISA standards, we meet NIST standards. It's kind of like how you see everybody saying military grade encryption, which assuming that they're actually meeting that standard. If one company starts doing it, everybody else has to do it to keep up, which makes everybody safer by default. There was an older story where the US Postal Service was secretly monitoring monitoring American social media accounts to look for any indication of an upcoming crime, which is super creepy, by the way, and it's just one more reason to avoid social media. You should join Detox Day August 2nd. Check out our latest videos. Cool, yeah, do all that. There's an update to that now. The EFS, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, they have now sued the U.S. Postal Service, claiming that it violates the First Amendment rights to protest and free speech. We'll see what happens. On a similar note relating to the EFF, if you live in America this week, the U.S. Congress will be voting on, among other things, Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, known as FISA, this is a major way that the U.S. government is allowed to access emails and other communications, quote, to aid in national security investigations. Basically, this is what authorizes the NSA to just collect everything indiscriminately and then for the police to go in after the fact and be like, well, since you have these communications, we'll go ahead and look through them. This year, four representatives have put forward an amendment that would severely limit the legality of mass surveillance. If you are an American voter, you may want to call your politicians and voice your opinion about that. Up next, 48 advocacy groups have called on the FTC to ban Amazon surveillance. These 48 civil rights and advocacy groups are organized by Athena, which asked the FTC to exercise its rulemaking authority by banning this technology, banning continuous corporate surveillance of public spaces, and protecting the public from data abuse. It's important to note they aren't just necessarily targeting Amazon specifically. They're kind of a textbook example of what the problem is, which is things like the Ring, the Alexa, and Sidewalk, which all together pretty much see everything going on 24-7. We'll see if anything happens with this. Our next story is going to go to Brazil. This is just a real quick one. Brazil has created a cyber attack response network. I think we covered something similar in New York a couple weeks ago. I'm going to quote the article. Brazil has created a cyber attack response network aimed at promoting faster response to cyber threats and vulnerabilities through coordination between federal government bodies. We're starting to see more and more countries create these organizations and these agencies to take the digital world more seriously and start responding faster. Next headline is space, the final frontier of Europe's migrant surveillance. Quote, a new industry is offering border agencies around the world access to advanced space-based surveillance capabilities once reserved for the most advanced intelligence agencies. They're using satellites able to track signals from satellite phones and other emitters. These companies are then selling access to the data obtained to anyone willing to pay, including UK and EU border agencies. Space is kind of a creepy new era of like tracking capabilities that we already kind of know of, but it looks like it's just leaking more into the real world and it's becoming more accessible. Our next couple of stories come from Australia. So the first one, COVID Safe uploaded 1.65 million handshakes and was only used by New South Wales and Victoria. The COVID Safe app identified 2,827 potential close contacts from 37,668 encounters in New South Wales and Victoria. Here's the interesting part to me. Only 17 cases were identified separately to manual contact tracing efforts. Not to be political, but in my opinion, this is a lot like surveillance in general, where we see that it's, it doesn't really do much that we haven't already been doing other ways. Maybe that was 
because of bad implementation or maybe just the wrong technology. It seems to me like we've covered a lot more data breaches than the 17 cases that this app found. This is why we're like so hesitant of these apps. It's starting to seem like the research is saying that the efficacy isn't really there. Again, maybe that's because not everybody's using it. I don't know. Maybe we're part of the problem. Our next story from Australia is also about COVID and contact tracing. I don't know how to pronounce that. Qantas, Qantas is working with the International Air Transport Association to make COVID-19 safe travel happen once the Australia's borders are reopened. We've talked about this. We're starting to see more and more places are wanting you to publicly disclose your vaccination status, which kind of like we talked about earlier with Ireland and their data breach, this may result in some sort of centralized database that you have to access. It's something to be aware of and we'll see how it unfolds. Our final political news. Taiwan probes reports of officials messaging accounts being hacked. Line is a messaging app in East Asia, which is kind of like WhatsApp, except it's not even end-to-end -end encrypted. They've been in trouble for the past for employee snooping as well as messages, which is not fun. More than 100 accounts belonging to officials displayed, quote, abnormal activities, and authorities are now investigating this. The moral of the story is use safe messengers that are ideally open source and have end-to-end -end encryption. We're now gonna move over to our FOSS section, free and open source. Our first story relates to Brave. With help Help from Google, an impersonated Brave.com phishing site has now pushed malware. Some attackers created Brave with an accented E.com. As a spoof of Brave.com, they purchased and ran Google ads to steer traffic to this website. So the moral here, check the website, try to use the official source whenever possible, avoid ads. So I guess this is another perk of ad blockers. You would have avoided this situation. There's not much to do once you're on the site, unless you're actively checking the URL and trying to catch that. It's more about prevention here. Before you download a program, maybe I would double check a URL. I've never thought about that before, but maybe it'd be good to recommend every time you download something, you should just check the URL real quick. Normally I'll do it when I'm logging into a sensitive account, but maybe I should start also adding that for when I download things. Now we're gonna talk about Firefox. Firefox VPN is now available in seven more countries, Austria, Belgium, France, Germany, Italy, Spain, and Switzerland. And they have added split tunneling, which is an amazing feature. Additionally, they have now changed their pricing to offer annual, semi-annual, and monthly subscriptions at $5, $8, and $10 a month respectively. It will stay $5 a month for customers who already signed up. Just so you guys know, it, Mozilla VPN is just Mulvad VPN with their own little Mozilla branded stuff. Generally speaking, we just recommend Mulvad. And now that Mulvad is monthly at half the cost, pretty much, you should just go with Mulvad. Up next, we're going to move over to Signal, the messenger. They have fixed a bug that sent random images to the wrong contact. This was a very serious bug, but it was very hard for them to catch. Someone reported this issue and they were trying really hard to reproduce it and they just couldn't reproduce it. And they finally were able to figure out what happened this month and they finally got it patched. Moral of the story, don't keep anything sensitive on your phone. It's kind of an unrealistic moral. Just be cautious when you're sending images and always double check. The thing that sucked about it is if you look at the article and the screenshots, you wouldn't know that it sent additional pictures. It looks like it just pulled random photos from the user's camera roll. You're right, sometimes that's not feasible, but if you can, try not to keep. I've got memes and stuff on my phone. That would certainly be weird if I sent my coworker like a random meme that didn't make sense in context, but it's not like they're gonna get a naked picture or something. <laughs> and that's what I mean when I say like sensitive with that bug, you wouldn't have even known if it sent that, they would just be like, uh, why'd you send me this? Also, if you're an Android user, go ahead and patch that. <laughs> I think my moral of the story here is just be so weird that it doesn't even seem like out of the ordinary if you send like a random friend a nude or something. Just start doing that now. And then when something like this happens, it's just like, oh, that's just them being them, just ignore it. Our next story is about the Matrix chat element. They have raised $30 million to boost Matrix. I'm gonna quote the article here. Element, the startup founded by the team who created Matrix, just raised $30 million of Series B funding in order to further accelerate Matrix development and improve Element, the flagship Matrix app. The round is led by Protocol Labs and MetaPlanet, the fund established by Jan Talon, co-founder of Skype and Kazaa. Personally, I'm not exactly reassured by those names, but we'll see what they do. So far, in my opinion, they haven't given us a reason to distrust them, so give them the benefit of the doubt. With the funding, they have said that they plan to complete peer-to-peer -peer Matrix implementations. They plan to implement a native decentralized end-to-end -end voice over IP or video conferencing and build a, quote, relative decentralized reputation system in order to combat abuse, unquote. This one is kind of unfortunate. So there's a app called Barinsta, which is a Facebook front end, kind of like Tedit 
or Knitter. Knitter is the Twitter front end, just like Tedit for Reddit. And these are all just like front ends for you to visit these sites without having to access the site. But Barinsta was served a cease and desist order from Facebook, which is very sad. Are they complying with the cease and desist order? As far as I know, yeah, they've gone ahead and stopped development and basically shut down. That's terrible. I know. Yeah, f Facebook. Yep. Our last FOSS story, software downloaded 30,000 times from, I'm not even gonna try to pronounce that, P-Y-P-L-P-I? Pi Pi. Pi Pi, sure. Ransack developers machines. So basically from what I can tell reading this article, this is another example of an open source publicly available repo that somebody co-opted and planted malicious code, which was then downloaded by anybody who accessed that repo, you know, who downloaded the code from it. This is just our periodic reminder. Open source is always preferable, but it does not automatically mean that it's perfect. It does not automatically mean that it's safer. You still have to use your best judgment and caution when accessing open source anything. We are now gonna move over into the Misfits to finish out the news this week. The first one, an Italian TV announcer at the Olympics did not realize he was on air when he asked the password for his computer. He then proceeded to claim that the password, booth.03, was too difficult to type and said it should have been something like Mickey Mouse, Goofy, or Pluto. He then complains they didn't need the dot because they're not, quote, NASA. There's a bit to break down here. One, I don't ever say passwords out loud to people. If someone asks me for a password or something, I'll text it to them through Signal or something like that. I normally have disappearing messages on, on Signal, so I don't mind too much. For unimportant things, for me, his attitude towards it is the most interesting thing. He's like, that's so complicated. We're not NASA. Like, why does it matter? So I think that's kind of the most interesting thing for me. People don't really see the importance of just basic security for their computers. That's a hard issue to deal with because that's very ingrained in our society. Our next story, a teenager on an airplane sent a photo of a replica gun via airdrop to everyone who had their settings configured to receive unsolicited photo from strangers. This caused a three hour delay as the plane still at the gate was evacuated and searched. The teen was not allowed to reboard. Whatever camp you fall in, whether this was overreaction or whether this was some teen making a bad joke, the moral here for the rest of us is turn off the features that you aren't using on your devices like Bluetooth and just try and secure your devices. In my opinion, these people are lucky that he didn't try to drop in some kind of malware or something that would have been like actually visually disturbing like gore pictures or porn. Turn off things you're not using. Our final story of the week. This is good for parents out there who are listening to this. Future AI toys could be smarter than parents, but a lot less protective. I actually want to start off by reading what some of these are because I was just going through this and it's like, oh, I've never seen this before. There's a Roy by robot which creates personalized lessons to teach kids educational subjects like science, languages, and math. It has a camera and microphone to detect facial and emotional reactions from kids, and all the information is collected and controlled through a parent or guardian's account. I do believe that's one of the good examples, but even then, that's an example of how these toys are looking nowadays. Between 2014 and 2017, a toy company called Genesis Toys sold My Friend Kayla, which was an interactive doll that could listen to and respond to kids. But it was recording its conversations with kids, as well as conversations with parents, siblings, and anyone else around the doll. They also said that they were able to share this data with third-party companies. There's a lot of stories. You can check them out in the sources, as always. This is basically just a warning to parents and would-be parents that smart toys are coming, you do need to be concerned about the data policies and you're literally trusting your kids with these toys. Well, that was all the news for the week. It was a pretty fun week. We covered a lot of big stories and some of them are still ongoing. We will see if Fresno does in fact add the license plate trackers to their parks. That should be fun. But that's it. So again, our promo spot this week is for the Monero community. And we do support Monero, both Nathan and I do. We want to thank you for listening to the surveillance support. We're happy to know that you're keeping up to date with the newest news. And of course, the final thing we always ask you is to share the podcast around because the more people who are educated on this stuff and hear about it, the more effective we're all going to be against all these issues. Thanks again for listening. Thank you, Nate. And see everyone next week.